Welcome to Short and to the Point, a podcast from the comeback in awful announcing. Here's your host, Jessica Kleinschmidt. Welcome back to Short and to the Point here on the Comeback and Awful Announcing. Jessica Kleinschmidt here. A very special episode today. Melanie Newman of the Baltimore Orioles. She, of course, does play-by-play, the first female to do so in that organization. And she's done a lot of other things for ESPN, of course, the BBC, MLB Network, all the things in a different variety. So not just play-by-play. We're talking color. We're talking, of course, hosting. Everything you can imagine, sidelines, she not only does, but does it well. In addition to being just a phenomenal woman that I look up to, she happens to be one of my best friends. So I might be a little biased in some of the things that I say about her, but we go over the fact that the Orioles are very, very successful right now. They're, of course, are leading the AL East, which means I have to know, how did they do it? Here and there, I'm pretty sure I can understand why, but she goes into depth about what is making that team so successful? The young guys, the more experienced guys, the pitching, the hitting, and of course, the clubhouse vibes, all very important. And we also talk about being a woman in this industry. Now, sure, there's a lot more representation, female representation in sports media and beyond. We're talking coaching. We're talking social media. We're talking the front office. We're talking PR, marketing. There's a lot more women in the industry than there ever was when her and I first got our start. But in my opinion, and I could be wrong, maybe, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot less women doing these jobs than maybe two or three years ago. I haven't done the numbers. I don't have any data or statistics to back that, but it feels like there aren't as many women doing the things that her, that she's doing that I'm doing or any of the front office duties feels like those are lacking. And I could be wrong, but we go over that as well. And, you know, maybe I'm overthinking it because your girl likes to do that. I will say, however, for the most part, women that I work with near my colleagues, People I bug and annoy and pick their brains about have been absolutely phenomenal and imperative to my success. And it's interesting to see how far I've come and they've come. And really the society and the industry as a whole has come to accepting and embracing women in this industry. And I talked to Melanie about that because at the end of the day, no matter how hard we work, we're never going to have the same resumes as, you know, Ben McDonald on her side, Jim Palmer on my side, Dallas Braden on my side, Johnny Gomes and Jerry Blevins and Shooty Babbitt, Bip Roberts. All of those guys are definitely going to have a better MLB playing resume than I ever will or she ever will. So how do we find a space for us? Will we go over that as well? So make sure that you tune in. And I'm so appreciative of everything that she's done. So here is my conversation with Melanie Newman. Welcome back to Short and to the Point here on the Comeback and Awful Announcing. Jessica Kleinschmidt here. A very special episode. I love getting to work with my friends. This one's extra special because she's one of my best friends, Melanie Newman. You guys know her, Orioles broadcaster. She does a little bit of everything for ESPN, BBC, MLB Network, all the things. Melanie, my dear friend, thank you for joining me today. It is so nice to start my day seeing your face, Jess. I know. I know. I can't be giddy. I gotta be cool. Gotta be cool. Gotta be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Which is going to be difficult. So bear with me, fans. I appreciate you. There's a lot to go over today, but we're going to start off with just how successful the Orioles have been and where they stand in the AL East. AL East. As of this taping, they are first in the division. And we're talking about a division that possesses a really hot Tampa Bay Rays team. We know the Yankees are always in question. So tell me, I'm going to make this question very, very broad, Melanie. What is working for the Orioles? Why are they in first place right now? It's it's everything. And, and it starts with the clubhouse. It's a historic clubhouse. I got to sit down with James McCann yesterday. He's been in the big leagues for 10 years and he's been to the postseason. He has seen some of the brightest stars in the game. Um, and, and he said it's the best clubhouse he's ever been in, which blew me away. And he was able to go into every little detail. They've got a good mix of veterans, all of these rookies who don't take it for granted. You have enough of a mix of guys who are from the States, from other countries to share their experiences and give some background as well, like all these different walks of life. But 
I, I mean, they love each other. There's no clicks. You don't even see pitchers with pitchers. I mean, they're they're literally hanging out with everybody all the time. They're playing card games when they're on the road. When you could do a million different things in some of these amazing cities that they've been in so far this year, and I, I don't think you can make that. You can't teach character. You can't teach guys to get along with each other. They really went in. And it started with the draft and drafting mm -hmm. high character guys and then making sure that everybody they've brought in has been of equally high character. Um, and, and you see that cohesion and that's what keeps them together. And I've asked, you know, they seem to get over losses a lot easier this year than in years past. And they, and they said, it's just this group, like we're so easy with just, okay, well, that's fine. That's one. We're obviously going to lose at least one. Kyle Gibson has been the leader of that. Like we can't go 162 and oh, I can't have, you know, a, a lossless year. So let's just take the losses and it is what it is. And we'll move on from there. But then on the field, they're doing everything right. And it's little things too. And you're talking about rookies like Gunnar Henderson and Jordan Westberg who are delivering in these big defensive plays. They don't miss a step. They're doing the fundamentals the right way. They, they have 35 comeback wins. And, and that's mm. because they do the little things correctly. Now I would like to have more than just a one run lead going into the ninth, because I'm going to start having gray hair here in a little bit, if mm -hmm. that's the case, but it just makes it so exciting. And you see the patience that they have at the plate. They all know what specifically they're looking for and how they want to read not only location and type of pitch, and it just makes it this overall performance that's so easy and fun to get behind. Yeah, and you talk about these one-run games, which is really fun to hear about because you want to complement the pitching. Like you mentioned, Gibson, of course, coming off a really strong series for him, but also these comeback wins. There's some scrappiness there, too. And tell me about that. Because you mentioned the clubhouse. There's a lot of young guys, but they're mature about it. Tell me about some of those, those comeback wins and how they're able to get a W at the end of it. I think it all started last year where we saw the Orioles offense really wouldn't click until the fifth inning on, which is frustrating when you see them doing nothing against a starter to get going and you're waiting for the final innings for any action to happen. But that carried into this year. The first six weeks was a lot of back end heavy scoring and not much up front. They shifted. We saw a lot in the front and then they weren't able to go out and finish it if they needed a little insurance or they needed to have that comeback performance. Now we're seeing a bit more balance. It is less runs overall, but they're scattering them throughout the game. The last two nights against Philadelphia alone, which is not an opponent to be taken for granted, the Phillies have tied it up. They have star power there. And Kyle Gibson has said, as a member of both teams, the Orioles are just the younger version of Philadelphia when it terms of star power names that everybody is going to get to know at some point. He said the only difference is you can't do a player for player comp because the Phillies kind of have guys rooted in one position and the Orioles are really built on versatility and playing all over the field. But Phillies have come back and tied it up, seventh, eighth, ninth inning, and the Orioles just come right back out there again against some of the best closers in the game. Craig Kimbrell, a pitch that opponents are averaging 126 off, and then you have a rookie in Colton Kowser who's able to drill his first extra base hit to put the team ahead. They just don't get too far ahead of themselves. You don't see them pressing a lot, even if they lose a couple games in a row. They just kind of slow the game down on their own, which in the time of the pitch clock is super impressive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, especially. And, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, if people aren't paying attention to the Orioles 24-7, that's one thing. But is there an aspect to the game that maybe we're not highlighting enough that's adding to that success? Because we know the pitching is there. Obviously, Adley, Adley Rutschman's becoming a guy that has been a star from the beginning. You mentioned Gunnar Henderson. What's an aspect of the game that people maybe aren't talking about enough? It's the small acquisitions, and no one batted an eye over the offseason. Ryan O'Hearn has the best OPS on the team, and he had to fight for a spot in spring training, and he still didn't get that spot. And when you look at him, he reminds me of Johnny Gomes when he first came up with Tampa Bay and was sent back down. And, and Johnny said, I will be so obnoxious. My numbers are going to be so good that I'm the minor league player on your minor league spotlight on the video board every night. I'm not coming back down. Ryan O'Hearn is that guy, and he has said it to us straight faced. There's no joking about it. He said, no, I'm not going back down. This is my spot. I'm staying in the big leagues. I deserve it. And the numbers have shown he put the Orioles up again last night before the Phillies came back for their walk off in the bottom of the ninth. Um, and he's been great at first base. The picks have been unreal. He knows how to read that pitching staff. And with Ryan Mountcastle dealing with that vertigo, they could have seriously faltered had they not had somebody like O'Hearn to step into that spot. And I think that's somebody who realizes for the first time he came to this clubhouse and he said, I've never been 
on a competitive team because it's always been Kansas City. And he never took that for granted for one minute. Now that he gets to be with that team, he's not letting that go for anything. I mentioned James McCann. This is a guy who's going to start earning more playing time. They're going to back off of Rutschman a little bit. He's had some overuse. McCann is second in the league in caught stealing, only behind Gabriel Moreno, who's the everyday catcher. That's saying something that he has not lost his edge at all. His pop time, his arm is fantastic. His framing, his pitch calling ability, everything about guiding, especially some of these younger pitchers like Grayson Rodriguez, It's so wonderful. You thought it couldn't get better than Robinson Chirinos coming in last year, and somehow it does. He just blends in so seamlessly. I mentioned Gibson, another guy. He wasn't this huge pick of the starting pitcher free agent market, but he was big enough. They put up the money to get him, to take him away from Philly. And again, another guy. He's a veteran, but he acts like he's 25. He's the leader of all of these celebrations they're doing. Um, and, And we could keep going on from there. Aaron Hicks who is out hitting all of the Yankees right now since he's come to the Orioles. Mm -hmm. Now he's injured at the moment, but I mean, these are guys that just don't miss a beat because they come in and it's easy to grasp how this organization ultimately wants to operate. And I actually asked Hicks before he got injured um, that morning of, I said, what is the difference for you? You're singing in the dugout, you're dancing in the clubhouse, you're taking these free swings. And, And he said with New York, everything was under a microscope of results based. So it was that at bat. It was a failure if it wasn't a hit. You know, in the whole game, it's under a microscope. It's results, results, results. And he said, and you get so overwhelmed and over-focused on that that you forget that in order to be successful, you do actually have to enjoy the game. You have to enjoy playing it because it's a game. And coming back to the Orioles, getting that chance to have that balance where results matter, but there's pieces around it that matter too. That's been everything for him. Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned that every time the Yankees are in town, they could be up by six runs, which happens quite frequently against the Oakland Athletics. They could be up, like I said, six, seven runs. Aaron Judge strikes out. Giancarlo strikes out. Fans will boo them. It blows my mind. It's like, what do you want? You know, like these things happen. Once again, Melanie (laughs) Newman joins me here on Short and to the Point. And, you know, it was really cool to watch you go overseas with the BBC and do the London series. And it was just a cool moment to see baseball go global, go internationally. What was it like to see a sport that you and I grew up loving and now that we're covering it be embraced by more than just the States? It's the privilege of a lifetime for me that the BBC trusted me with this, tabbed me to be the play caller for it. Uh, it's been, they're a wonderful organization, first of all, just the the support, the inclusion, um, the way that they go about making sure that we deliver the sport the right way to fans in Europe so that they can grasp it and expand it. It's been more than I could ever ask for. Obviously getting to travel for a job for a team like that is is just the icing on the cake but you walk down and, and we've all been to crown jewel events before and you see all of the national pundits that you either know or you know who they are and it was surreal to know that we were the national home broadcast and there were just hundreds of people i had never seen before i had never known never met you know you have all these different entities you have the espn branch that's over there they have sky sports they had uh formula one out there the mclaren team was taking in batting practice with the Cardinals and getting to see the Cardinals and the Cubs react to just a different environment and getting to be in front of new faces and how cool it was. You know, we've all traveled and sometimes we take that for granted, but you could tell in that moment, not one of them took being in London for granted and just how different it is to experience a ballpark and fans for the first time. I'm just so excited to see where Major League Baseball grows in the future, because if this is any indicator of where it's going to go, it's going to be big. And I mean, they didn't originally have the broadcast for the 2019 series. That's how successful that series was, that it made it a must broadcast series. And and I'm just thankful again that we've gotten to experience this. Taking over Trafalgar Square, that's literally the equivalent of taking over Times Square in New York City to host a virtual home run derby and wrapping our minds around that, that that's the kind of power this sport is bringing in is just the coolest. Yeah. And I think it's so important for us to remind ourselves that because we're from an an era where people are saying baseball's boring, baseball's boring, baseball's boring. And I hate those people because if you go to a baseball game with me, I can promise you, I I will find little nuggets to make (laughs) 
fall in love with the sport. And yeah, and like next year, they're going to continue the expansion and, and, and introducing the sport to other people across the world. And I'm excited you get to be a part of that as well. And just to see you personally and, you know, X, of course, for, he also did, Xavier Scruggs did that with you. They were just embraced. It felt like you guys really belong there. I feel like that was important as well. It's the first time since COVID that I have had a sporting event that I've been able to work that I was legitimately sad as we were getting ready to put our headsets on for that final day because it you wait so long for it. And then the three days fly by so quickly. And, and it's a wonderful team. And Felix White, our British analyst, is one of the most eloquent and beautiful speakers about our game. And I would encourage anybody to just go find some of the things he says about baseball because it made me really fall in love with the sport all over again. And not just yeah. from that, you. and I know you get what I mean by this, when you're sitting in the stands and you're not working and you're in like a comfy sweatshirt and you have a beer and you just get to take in the game, he elevates it to that next level because he talks about the fact that baseball is the only sport in the world that breathes with your life every single day. And you have bad days and so does baseball. And you still have to show up tomorrow because baseball is showing up tomorrow. Um, I'm just so excited to work with them again and to see where we take it from here. I know we have London again next year, but they're looking at Paris and Germany and all these other places. And I think we're going to get to share that with a lot of people. And for the record, people who say baseball is boring don't actually watch the game. It's the same people who are like, oh, Nickelback is the worst. And they don't actually listen to Nickelback. It's just a popular opinion that has no base that they just decided to glom onto. Yeah. Don't be a sheep, people. Make your own assessment. And I'm, you know, I'm going to say it. They're probably going to clip this and I feel like crap. Nickelback is not that bad. Duh. I like Nickelback. I, like I think Nickelback. they got a bad rap. We're going to, um, I listened to them my first day in Philly. That was my soundtrack for the day. Yeah. It's like, you know, somebody else says it. So don't be a sheep people. Be authentic, be your true self. And it, it's interesting that you brought this up. Cause I talk about it a lot, watching it as a fan and I'm, it's so interesting. I, I didn't do it at all last season. Obviously, you get caught up in work. How important is that to you? You know, and, and, and it's it's hard. Timing changes a lot of things. It's very difficult. But I used to make a point to go to a game for fun, whether it's a minor league game, a major league game. I feel like you have to do it because you have to remind yourself that we once we love this sport. It's no different for the players. Like sometimes you take a step back. It is a job. It is their livelihood. But taking in a game, like you said, a big, big ass sweatshirt, a beer. Are you a hot dog person? Cool. A pretzel person, whatever. You just got to go as a fan to appreciate it again. You really do. And I'm, I'm so lucky that where we live, most of the Orioles affiliates are in my backyard. Um, so it does make it easier for those off days to just kind of pop over. And, and I love the minor league environment. Obviously, I grew up in it, but um, it just gives you a chance. I feel like when I sit in big league stands and I listen to the chatter around me, I either want to jump in and like if somebody says something that's completely inaccurate, I just want to say like, hey, no, this is actually why this is happening. Or you just have that need to like, I know things and I need to share these things with you. But being in the minor leagues where I think people just really do take it in to enjoy the game for what it is. Obviously there's a bigger entertainment component to the minor leagues. A lot of our affiliates actually have their own beer labels, which is really cool getting oh. to check out what they have. Um, it, it's just a different type of place to just kind of be yourself and relax a little bit. I haven't gotten to do it this year um, mm -hmm. just because things have been a little crazier than in the past, but that's something I'm kind of eyeing coming up here. I did take the all-star game, um, the final four innings of that. I was finally able to sit in the stands. I had we a got four innings, mama. Let's go. Final four innings. We got four innings to be a fan. Let's go. I had four <laughs> innings. And you know what? It was perfect because guess who came in? Yenia Cano, Felix Bautista, Adley Rutschman. It was just, I was just timing it up so I could be more biased. But I sat with this woman next to me. I didn't know her, but she was a longtime Seattle Mariner season ticket holder. Those were her and her husband's seats that they were sitting Aww. in that afternoon and getting to share that space with her and, and the aspect of the game was just really, really cool. I love that. Yeah. Brett Rooker went in around the like later when I was doing my in-game analysis, it, they like knew he was going to be a late intro which is fine it worked out he ended up helping the al but it's interesting you brought up the like the minor leagues and obviously you 
grinded through the minor leagues. It's what you and I kind of bonded over. But who is the biggest name that you ever had as a beer batter? Do you remember any of those? Because when it comes to the beer batter, for those who don't know, it's a player in the middle of the lineup. Usually he's on a rehab assignment, so it's a bigger name. And if he strikes out in the second or third inning, beer has a huge discount. It's like $2 for a little thing of beer. <laughs> Do you, did you ever have any of the beer batters in the minors? So I had teams that we played against who would do that, but okay. all of the teams that I belonged to um, never had that. Now we did have in Mobile um, a mid-inning game, I, I guess you could call it, was on field where people physically rolling kegs um, mm. and, you know, whoever rolled theirs to the finish line first was the winner. That was our Thirsty Thursday activity that we got to do. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of watching, I, I mean, some of the best to ever do it. I, I watching under NCRT in center field was oh, wow. the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he Pretty made good. everybody else look like they moved in slow motion. And on the other side of that, JT Real Muto was the double A catcher at that point. And he was like this man among boys. It was, you could tell, like he's going to be in the big leagues and it wasn't even going to be an issue for him. And he still looks the same way today. Um, Archie Bradley was moving. He was still a starter. He was trying to develop a knuckle curve because he had a five ERA and couldn't figure it out. Uh, obviously now he's found himself in the bullpen and he did not need the knuckle curve. Thank goodness. <laughs> but um, yeah, you look back at some of the names that come through and I could go on with, especially the big league rehabs that we've had that I've been so fortunate to develop those relationships with, but, um, no, there's been some pretty cool, cool moments. Yeah. I remember one time I, a beer batter for me was Hunter Pence. So imagine being <laughs> a world series winner and then you're in triple a, I believe it was a, it was either rehab or he was, you know, some, some sort of situation, but he it was second inning. And if he struck out, you got a discount on beer. And they did that a lot. It was very Reno. We were Reno Aces. Not to mention, I love Melanie. That yeah, Melanie had the baby diamondbacks before I got them, which was really interesting. And and then Jerks and Profar, I think, was once a beer yep. batter, Elvis Andrews. So it's really cool to like, oh, how the mighty have fallen. But at the end of the day, <laughs> if I wasn't working, I would be able to thank Hunter Pence for my two dollar beer. But I was working. I will say though, when I go to a game for fun and I'm chugging a beer, I feel so guilty. I'm like, wait, am I allowed to do this? It doesn't like, feel I, correct. It feels weird. It feels very, very weird. You don't have a credential on. You're like, you have to be in charge of a ticket, which stresses me out. Like, you know, I get a little diva ish. I'm like, I'm not allowed down on the field. Like, what? Like, it's kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I literally I sat down in my seat at the uh, the All Star game. And of course, there'd been a kid there because he's like, oh, look, no one's here through like five innings. So this is obviously a seat that I can sit in. And uh, I had my little, like, my belt bag. It's a fanny pack. It is what yes. it is. But I had that on and I unzipped it and took out. Um, I don't remember what it was. It's a canned cocktail basically. And it's, yeah, it was solid, but, and, and everybody's looking at me like, where, where are you just bringing liquor out of your bag? Like, what, what is this? But look at yeah. no hand. Like you, you don't, you don't think we bring those little bags. We, yeah. Eyeliner to touch up because mama gets a little sweaty lip gloss mm -hmm. um, powder because also sweaty and then a canned cocktail. <laughs> just saying just saying also i've been cheating on white claws a lot with high noons vodka i've soda. never been in on either of those i want to say this might be like a bud light like a tropical fruit punch i think it's vodka okay um, i i just can't i can't do like super bubbly seltzery type drinks gotcha. and this one's kind of more of like a straight cocktail it was fantastic yeah, not to mention Melanie's one of my best friends, but she can't drink wine. So there's now you guys understand where we are at. It's you know, you do a lot of things for the people you love. And and that's one of them. Um, speaking <laughs> of, you know, it's it's not lost on us that many women are in the, the jobs that we have. And it's something I don't bring up a lot because I want your work to shine. But and I want it to be highlighted. But being a woman in this industry has its own bumps in the road, its own trials. And there are, but there are so many positives also. And I think about me, you and Danny's, of course, our group chat that saves my life every, every day. day, every single day. But, you know, I guess the, the easiest way I can ask this is what's so special about being a woman in baseball, specifically working in this industry? 
we have access that people will never ever have period it, I, I don't care how nice of a guy you are it does not it's just a biological understanding between the two that we have an ability to emote on a different level and i think that's a very special thing to to realize and and to take advantage of and to hone and um i've, I've had players come up to me in the past that have said you know i know at some point you're going to want to talk about my my swing adjustment or my numbers and stuff like that but it's also nice knowing that the first thing and this was something that chirinos would remind me a lot of last year is you start with good morning or good afternoon and you ask how their family's doing or you ask how they're doing or you mention you give them a human piece for a moment because they're not these numerical transactions mm -hmm. that they would appear to be on paper um and i think there's a level of knowing that they can sit down with you and, and I'm not saying this is just across the board. You have to cultivate trust. You have to cultivate yeah. that respect between them. But they also know that there's going to be a little more of that human capacity there. And, and that's exactly why I sat down with James McCann yesterday. We had no discussion prior to it. It was a live interview. And just getting a truly honest answer from him about the human element of the clubhouse and why it's so special, where I know a lot of people, you know, let's talk about your numbers and let's dive into this and why you're doing this and blah, 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 blah. I, I think we're at a really special point right now where we're the peak of the late nineties, early two thousands of really just making them black and white numbers on paper to getting back into that human element and empathizing a little more and, and showing people why, because it's not relatable to hit 350 and make $5 million. Fans don't get that, especially in today's economy when you're dealing with inflation and everything else. Mm -hmm. That's where you can have that disconnect. But you remind them, these guys have struggles. You know, they bleed the same way we do. They've been through life events that have shaped them. Um, and I think when you find that, that ability to have common ground, that's where you hear fans rooting for these athletes because there's something in them that they recognize or they appreciate and they want to emulate. And, you know, it's interesting because as women, we have to depend on those numbers in a certain way. You and I don't have the same resume as Ben McDonald. We don't have the same resume oh as Dallas. Yeah, that's Dallas Braden. So I can't sit there and say I completely understand what you're talking about in the form as it pertains to playing. Our resumes will forever be different. I will never step foot on a major league baseball field as a player, period, no matter what I do. So we have to depend on some of those numbers, but we also, like you said, have to find the human element. Was it easy for you to find that balance or what was the challenge there? Because obviously when you get started in play by play, you the numbers are important, but you have to tell the story of what's going on on the field and still get a quote or two and find out about their families and find out about their background, find out what college they went to, didn't go to their draft selection. It's a lot to balance. Was that easy for you or did you find a rhythm or what was that trans uh, transition like? Yeah, I've, I've always been the, the human side of things. I think that started when I was in high school. And ironically enough, I get that from my dad, just being wired in, in a heart first. I think that's everybody's one or the other, you know, you're either logically wired or you're emotionally wired. And that was it for me. And I always wanted to understand what they were going through and what they were feeling in that moment more than anything else. I understood the rules, but you know, what's behind the person who's making those plays ultimately happen. And it just kind of grew throughout my time. And I think some of that is because I started as a writer and you know, this, it gives you a little more space to freely put that out there and to put it into words and and for as many words as you want about why somebody is the way they are um i haven't written in a long time but i remember my last piece being on ian happ and he was kind of this question mark for fans of he never smiles and you know what why is this guy the way he is and getting to lay that out is special um and again something that i don't take that trust lightly at all that they're letting me kind of tell their own story even though today we always used to say well Athletes don't really have platforms and we're giving that to them with social media. Now they do have those platforms. So it's finding a way to continue to evolve that and to do them a service at the end of the day, we're here to serve them. But as I worked my way through, that was always at the forefront was the human element telling those stories. Now it is learning the numbers and it mm -hmm. is learning the mechanics and what does this certain adjustment mean? What is the, you know, relay effect of when you change this one thing, how does that change the rest of it? What's the bigger picture? 
Um, and I've just tried to be honest with people and, and, you know, I don't want to come off as pretentious or pretending I know something when I don't. And I've had really, really good guys in the game who have been so kind to just break it down for me without any kind of patronization or, you know, rudeness about it. And I just said, look, I don't know. And I'm trying to learn. I know I can't feel a ground, but feel the ground ball. I'll never be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. We never need to see the footage of me hitting in the home run derby in London because it's yes, like, I do. Yes, I do. it's the worst thing to ever exist. No, <laughs> just, you can text Andrew. He almost left me about it. It's fine. Four <laughs> years down the drain because I can't swing a bat. Um, but you know, I just, I just kind of, you walk up and, and Chris Young last year was one of the best analysts I could have ever had because you hear glove side, arm side a lot. Oh, he's missing a lot on his glove side, or he's really heavy on his arm side today. And I said, you know, I just, I need you to break this down for me for a minute because I'm just having trouble making sure I fully understand it. And I never want to use a term incorrectly, right. um, especially on air and just having that ability, you know, Ben McDonald the other day, I said, I'm having a brain fart right now. Reverse splits. Is that left on left or left on right? Like is right. it opposite or same side? And he, he took no issue with it because I'm just laying my cards on the table saying, Hey, I'm having a day, you know, walk, walk me through a term real quick so that I make sure I understand what's going on. And some people say, you know, oh, that's so stupid. And how did she get into the big leagues? If she doesn't understand this, you have to grow from some point. And, and I just don't think lying or pretending about it and then getting it wrong. And then fans are now miseducated is the way to do it. You have to have, an ounce of humility going, you know what? I'm waking up stupid today, but I'll be a little smarter by the time I go to bed. Yeah. And and here's the thing we're, we have to do right by them too. So if we don't double up on the question, we're both screwed, but you know, who was always yeah. amazing about it. I know you're going to have my back on this is, is pitcher Cole Irvin. He um, is not only a wonderful human being, but he's engaged to Kristen, who is a broadcaster, reporter for NBC sports. And I remember the last day of last season, of course, this is before he was traded. I pulled him aside and I just said, thank you. You know, cause I like, he would use a lot of these terms that weren't just baseball slang, but the way he was describing some of his pitches that were working and weren't, I said, what do you mean by this? And what do you mean by that? And he would just break it down for me without skipping a beat, without making me feel yeah. stupid. And, and he knew that not only did I need to do right by him when I go on the broadcast and talk about him, but he said, my fiance goes to the same thing. Like she knows the questions that you have to ask and you want to be correct about things. You want to make sure you're not just going on the broadcast. And my broadcasters correct me all the time too. So we're so thankful for them because just yeah. like you said, I'm not, I don't want to make this about myself, sorry, but I, I can just relate on that level and to know that we have just as many questions to make ourselves better, to make them look better is fantastic. So it's, exactly. it's so important. Um, now, before I let you go on the same energy, you know, I'm, I'm currently recording this, pro this podcast. I'm so thankful for awful announcing the comeback for giving me this platform and this opportunity, but you know, I'm also on the A's broadcast. I also am writing and stuff. And the reason why is because of Melanie Newman. And I want you to tell the story about, you know, the conversation we have, we had right before, MLB.com called me and my career essentially took off. <laughs> I will never forget it for as long as I live because we have both kept each other in this industry when we have both been two seconds away from walking out the door. And every day, I don't think people understand. I love being here. There's always one good thing a day that I can kind of pick out and go, you know, this is just the coolest. This is where I'm supposed to be, but it doesn't make it hard. And, and we mentioned being a woman in the space earlier. And when you get an opportunity that's this big, what they don't really tell you about being a minority, having that opportunity is it almost feels like you're on a conveyor belt and you're going to go through all these different experiences, but you can't get off because then if you get off, everything behind you falls apart. And that's including the women and the girls that are trying to do the same thing that we're doing. And so it's this constant pressure to constantly show up and perform and, and you're just stuck in this space. Um, but again, it's a, it's a good thing. It just doesn't mean that it's not without problems. Everybody has problems. You just pick which problems you're willing to deal with. And you had kind of been up and down through some jobs. I was still gutting it out in the minor leagues and we formed our relationship on Twitter because mm -hmm. that's what 
did in 2010 yes. when you could actually still use Twitter. Yeah. And um, you were done. You were you were pretty done. You you couldn't find the next job you wanted to move on to. You had done gambling and betting and you were trying to write here and there and you weren't being taken seriously. And, and you just said, you know, I think I'm going to find something else. And, and I, I just wasn't willing to accept it at all because you were the one person I had in the space who was like me. And, um, you know, if you quit, I quit. You jump, mm-hmm. I jump, Jack. And, and I don't really want to quit right now. So you're not allowed to quit because mm-hmm. I don't know what else to do. Um, and I'm so glad that we were able to be honest with each other in that space and to death grip onto you and, and to make you keep showing up for a couple more days. Because I think, wasn't it literally like the next morning that it was, it was either hours or like the next day. Yeah. Or I mean, it, it was day, within yeah. 24 hours that you, you ultimately found out that um, you were getting your next job opportunity and it was a national platform and, mm-hmm. and you thrived and you grew that big enough to make the leap to the next level. And, Mm -hmm. um, I remember, God, I think it was, it might've been Frisco. Um, when I found out that I was not being brought back while spring training was already underway. Um, and I thought that was kind of the end of the line for me, you know, all the jobs are already taken. It's mid February. Um, and you just kept encouraging me that I had to stay here because I didn't let you quit. Now you won't let me quit. And, the chips fell where they were. A guy who had just accepted a job left that job for a different job. And I swooped in and told them I would basically work for free. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that launched everything. And I finally got a national break there. But um, I mean, I'm not I'm not here without you by a long shot um, in many, many ways. And I, I just I don't think I ever forget that ever. Yeah, me neither. And and same thing. I mean, we're very thankful for the opportunities, but it can get hard and it can get lonely. And if it wasn't for you and Danny, like literally this this situation right now, talking on this platform would not be happening. So before and after everything, I just want to say thank you once again. And I want, you know, I'm one of those people who likes to thank people publicly. So I wanted to thank you a million times once again, my, my dear friend. You You're are the best. The best. And, and also on that note, thanks for stopping by Short and to the Point. I love you very much. I love you. It's so great to be on Short and to the Point. Finally. I know. I know. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie Newman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. That was Melanie Newman, obviously a very important person in my life and in this industry, making baseball more relevant to those and making the Orioles more relevant. They, of course, are leading the AL East as – the moment I tape this. So who knows what's going to happen? Cause it's a very interesting division when you possess a team like the Tampa Bay Rays. She of course is not only imperative to my success, but the uh, success of a lot of young women. So I'm so thankful for her. Thank you so much for stopping by short and to the point here on the comeback and awful announcing. Thanks to Philip for keeping this ship afloat. Always thankful for everything that he's done and learning on the fly, just as I am. Make sure you're liking and subscribing to us here on the YouTube channel at The Comeback TCB, and we'll see you next time. Want even more short and to the point? Follow Jessica at JD and head over to thecomeback.com and awfulannouncing.com.